Sex is wintertime temperature. That seems to be the limit. That, that what has historically limited how far north these insects can occur is how cold it gets during the winter because of all the different aspects of climate change we've talked about already or that may be aware of or not aware of, one of the more interesting and, and, and significant, or I would say significant, dramatic ones is the rise in average wintertime temperature, particularly here in the northeast United States over the past several decades. Again, so you don't have that limiting factor anymore. They can survive. The point is they can survive much further north than they could before, so it's expected for them to continue to expand expand the range northward through northeast United States, even under what we consider low emission scenario. That's not good <laughs> for the hemlock groves that occur here. And when you look at the distribution of hemlocks, they are more common. You get much more extensive stands the further north you go. So the concern is loss of hemlocks force there. What about impacts on animals? You're back to birds. You know, I got away from talking about birds. There are some birds that you find principally, if not, or primarily, if not even exclusively, in hemlock forests that this is their prime nesting habitat, and we call them hemlock obligates because they really don't nest very well, if at all, elsewhere, such as some very beautiful birds like the blue-headed vireo, the black burning warbler, that studies are showing their numbers are declining as we lose these hemlocks. They don't have suitable nesting habitat anymore. So there's an example of a more indirect effect of climate change through its um, effect on a pest species that's changing the habitat and food availability for these birds. So I think the last group I want to talk about before we go on and hear about some other types of animals are seabirds. We've been focusing so far on terrestrial environments, right? Land environments, that's a little bit about coast. What about oceans and marine environments? Are there any impacts that are expected to occur there or are already occurring? And of course the answer, oh I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. Let's, let's mention one more indirect effect with pests, in this case a disease causing agent. Uh, and that is, uh, well, the, the range of many disease-causing agents is also expected to expand into more northern or higher latitudes, whichever hemisphere you're talking about. Uh, for example, how this might impact birds, obviously there's, a, it, it, there's a, it, an interest and importance to human health. We may actually talked about it in a previous uh, presentation. But in terms of birds, for example, in Hawaii, one of their principal um, effects they have to deal with is avian malaria. There's malaria, pr protists that um, birds can contract malaria from. In Hawaii you have a lot of higher, I shouldn't say a lot, but you have distinct high elevation areas where you find a lot of the native birds spend their time. There's not a lot of native birds anymore down in the lowland areas. What has become a refuge for them, and if not, if you're aware, Hawaii is a great case example where they've lost are losing and have lost a lot of the bird diversity already. There's several species that have gone extinct in recent decades, and it, it doesn't look good at all in terms of the ones that are still um, haven't gone extinct yet. What has perhaps um, kept them from going extinct at a faster rate so far is they have this refuge here at mid to high elevations where mosquitoes can't can't go. It's too cold for them. Of course, what's happening? Temperatures warming. Those mosquitoes already they're showing are expanding their range higher in elevation, so now birds that have never been exposed to malaria and thus have not evolved any type of resistance immunity are now coming down with avian malaria and getting killed rather quickly. So this refuge that they had from that is shrinking and of course again you're limited by the top of the mountain so obviously the concern on the part of our biologists is that you know the spread of avian malaria at higher elevations that's just going to accelerate the loss of these species of birds. So now, going to ocean environments, what effect might that have? Here's a nice summary. I thought I couldn't put it in better words than besides my summary title at the top of what this talks about. This focuses on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but they're finding um, similar examples of this in other parts of the ocean. That the key phrase here is that sea temperatures during ENSO events, I'll come back to what that means, but Sea temperatures disrupt the nutrient cycling of the ecosystem. In ocean environments, a lot of seabirds depend heavily on, well, the food sources they depend on are linked very closely with the cycle of nutrients, particularly what we call upwelling. That in your typical ocean environments, the nutrients tend to be down towards the bottom, lower depths, and due to the movement of currents, which is largely due to changes in um, the amount of heat in different parts of the water column. 
that those currents bring up nutrients to the surface, and those are areas of high productivity, and that's where you find seabirds concentrating their feeding activity and, and, and their nesting activity. Although they nest on, on, on land, uh, but they, they nest in areas close to that. So we're finding this disruption of the nutrient cycling. In other words, these areas that used to have, the, these seabirds used to rely on as a great source for food is no longer true. And they're linking it with ENSO events, which is El Nino events. You might have heard of that term in La Nina, uh, which is a change in the Western Pacific and how fast that warms due to change in wind patterns. But we don't have to go into detail with that here. What you want to realize, or the first thing is, okay, wait a minute, we're talking about climate change, now we're talking about El Nino events. That, you know, those are two different things, right? They are, but there's a relationship that there's now, the, there's now evidence to suggest that El Nino events are becoming more frequent, more intense, and lasting longer as a product of climate change. So climate change is an underlying indirect cause of these types of El Nino events that we're now starting to see and that the world is experiencing. A couple other impacts on seabirds, corals. I know Dr. Gian, I think, was going to say some more about corals. I just wanted to mention about how coral reefs are really um, suffering some major impacts from many different uh, causes, but one of the ones is climate change. And as average ocean temperatures warm, that can cause bleaching of coral, and it's causing a bleach, bleaching of coral. Whether it's here in white, they're actually expelling their algal partners, and so that's affecting their health, um, and can eventually kill them. When they first become bleached, they're not, they're not dying, but they can eventually die. If we have loss of coral reefs, as you can imagine, that's going to impact, or are you losing coral reefs, that's impacting a lot of seabirds who depend on the food that you find in coral reefs. Coral reefs are very important places for uh, fish populations to sustain themselves. And again, I'm sure Dr. Jan's going to that more. So seeing the loss of coral reefs uh, due to changes in climate is expected and is already affecting seabirds as well. And just to end it, Sticking with the seabird um, uh, category here, um, I'm going to give you another example, another case study based on personal experience. I was fortunate enough this uh, August to travel to the Gaspé Peninsula, which is in eastern Canada over here in Quebec. And I was lucky enough to go to the largest gannet colony in North America. Thousands of these seabirds called northern gannets, beautiful birds, just packed. I mean, this doesn't anywhere to do its justice. These birds, you just have this high concentration of birds in a small area. Thousands of birds that nest here and they forage in the water around here for fish and other food. Research that Canadian scientists are doing there, I got to talk to a few of them and got to see the results, are showing that these birds are spending more of their time foraging further into the estuary than over here due to climate change, due to warming ocean waters. That what's happening is as the oceans warm that Food that used to be reliably found here is not found there anymore. It's more reliably found here. We say, okay, well that's fine. It's, it's more reliable there. At least it's reliable somewhere. But what's the problem? They're having to travel much further to get to that food. They're finding that's a problem. They're spending too much time traveling, not enough time feeding their young. They're losing a lot of energy. Those parents are tired. The young aren't getting enough food. They're not growing as fast. So they're starting to see that impact with this seabird. So I think that's a, a fair coverage of introduction to the different types of impacts that we're seeing, both direct and less direct, of climate change. And I did want to end by just saying, by, by going back to, okay, so we're seeing all these impacts on birds, and we'll hear about other animals and other changes from these other talks. And the next question is, what can be done to try and mitigate this problem or even solve this problem? And that comes down to understanding how the climate is changing, which we're getting a much, you know, every year, every month, better understanding of that, although there's still a lot we don't know. And quite frankly, that's disconcerting and frightening to, to a lot of people, not, still not knowing what's expected. But then that comes back to what? That comes back to what is causing global warming and climate change. If it's natural factors alone, one can make the argument, well, then there's not much we can do rather than just kind of adapt to it, prepare for what's expected to come, try and help out this, the wildlife that we have to what extent we can, because it's important to us as we can you know, hold on the conversation. Or rather, if there is an important part of climate change that's due to human activities, then we can definitely do something about it in that sense in curtailing the 
uh, activities or reducing our impact in that way. And just again to emphasize, because I don't think it get emphasized enough or communicated um, the extent that it should, is we have strong evidence that human activities are the primary cause of the current global warming that is occurring, period. That is known with much certainty. Over 95% of all climatologists now agree with that statement. That is not in question. And there's a lot of lines of evidence um, that show this, but I think one of the best and strongest that I always like to talk about and communicate to people is this. Um, beautiful study, actually a series of studies. They started a long time ago, actually back in the 80s, and have continued. And the way the approach that these researchers, researchers took was this, to say, okay, let's realize that we have lots of causes, lots of factors out there in the natural environment that are linked with Earth's t surface temperature that can either increase or decrease in temperature. Notably, there's a whole list, but the primary ones are uh, the amount of energy that the sun puts out. That's not constant, that changes, that changes um, constantly. We have the tilt of the Earth's axis, we have volcanic activity, but we know enough about those effects and, and how they influence temperature that we can model that. And so let's go ahead and do that. Let's model that, and that's what's shown in blue here, and this just goes back to 1850. So the blue band is what we would expect the Earth's surface temperature to be if only natural, they call it forcings, were operating. So that's what you see in blue. What you show in pink is now if we add human activities, notably greenhouse gas emissions from combustion of fossil fuels, from agriculture activities, from deforestation, and that's what's shown in pink. Okay, there's our expectation, natural only, natural plus human. Now let's look at the actual temperatures, how they've changed, the black line. Which of those bands does that lie closest to? That's interesting. It's nearly on top of the pink band. That's clearly showing that, I guess the best way to say it is, natural factors cannot alone explain the current warming trends occurring, and thus it's primarily due to greenhouse